morning, everybody, to what is actually episode two, minor typo there, of, uh, of uh, the ND Forum, which is a, a forum that we have recently begun. Um, and the idea is to just bring like-minded people in the industry, thought leaders, people who are out there, we think, um, trying to make a positive change in this life insurance industry that we love. And this morning, it's my greatest pleasure to introduce Dean Moore, the, the MD and founder of Just. And uh, over the course of the, the next sort of 40, 45 minutes, hopefully give you a bit of insights into who he is, um, as well as just a bit more understanding of Just and, and what they believe. You know, I'll give you a chance to, to, <laughs> to introduce yourself in a little while. So maybe just to kick off, a quick slide or two just around who Icon is. Most of you attending have, have heard us speak before or work with Icon. Um, so I'll run through this fairly briefly. But the reality is that we all know that too many people live in constant fear and stress about their financial circumstance. And our greater vision is we want to help people achieve financial freedom. Now, that vision sounds um, ambitious. It, it sounds in some ways a little bit lofty and idealistic. And it also sounds similar to the vision of almost every other financial advisor in the industry. So the question is, what, what, what is Icon going to do about that? How are we going to try and make a difference in that space? And for us, it's all about quality, independent financial advice. At Icon, we unashamedly believe that the customer is better off if they're able to access quality, independent financial advice. And the trend that concerns me probably the most in the industry, and as a financial advisor, it's becoming more and more difficult to deliver quality financial advice at scale in a way that's economically viable for you. So we want to democratize great financial advice and we want to deliver the best value to customers by enabling you, the financial advisor, to give informed, holistic advice to clients. So every single thing that Icon does, the reason we exist is to enable financial advisors to do what they do best, and that's remain independent, build relations with their customers, and deliver quality advice. And if we can help you do that, your clients will get the best product fit, the best value for money, and the most effective use of premium freeing up funds for wealth creation. And to close that loop a little bit further, given the, the topic of this morning, it's not just about wealth creation, it's in how do you most effectively deploy that wealth to provide you with a retirement of financial freedom and a stable income stream. So if we take that a step further, the question is, well, why does all of this matter? Why is it necessary in the first place? And we talk about the cost of distribution over and over again, and the reality is it is expensive, but it's only expensive if it's not delivering the right result. And some of the statistics that concern us are these three. The first one is that only 6% of South Africans can afford to retire at 65. This statistic has varied only slightly over the past few years, or in fact, over the past decades. Flipping it around, it means 94% of South Africans are unable to retire and to retire comfortably. And that's probably one of the most important things that Dean's gonna be taking us through later on and understanding what are those implications for South Africa, for the broader society, and what can we as an industry do about that? The next point for me is an incredible contradiction. How do we have the situation where South Africans are unable to afford to retire, yet in the 55 and older age group, clients are overinsured for life cover by more than 200%. Now, that's the age when your risk premiums are at their most expensive. That's money that's been spent on life cover that's not required. And that's money that's unable to be deployed <clears throat> into investment and savings. So most of our con story and our message is around how do we rebalance this? How do we take our risk guidance framework and shift the mix of risk cover that our customers have? And we want to do that to free up spend, to deploy to income, to investments and savings. And then to close the loop, really the great, the great opportunity of the partnership with Just and the benefits that they present is to say, well, once we've done that, once we've effectively helped our clients build wealth, create wealth and get to a point where when they get to retirement, they actually have a nest egg, is how do we help them? How do we help them invest this nest egg? How do we help them use this money most effectively to provide the income that they need in retirement. 
So the things that we often talk about in the rebalancing space really for me is two areas. The one is the mix of cover across the various benefit types. Again, intuitively, we, we all understand that you need more disability cover than life cover. If you pass away, there's one less mouth to feed. If you're disabled, you need to look after yourself as well as your family. Again, that seems obvious, but the reality is in the market today, South Africans have twice as much life cover as disability cover. The second point for me is that we believe strongly that the primary reason for life insurance or, or broader risk cover in general is to provide you and your family with an income stream if you're unable to earn one yourself. The best match for that is a benefit that pays out an income. Again, we know this, and I think intuitively it makes sense, but in the market today, 90 to 95% of all cover sold are lump sum benefits. And our opportunity is to start shifting that behavior. Shift the mix from an over-reliance on life cover to disability and living benefits, and shift the mix from an over-reliance on lump sum benefits to a combination of income and lump sum. And in doing that, we are absolutely convinced that we can reduce the cost of risk cover by up to 20 to 25%, freeing up valuable money that can be deployed towards investments and savings. And then looking at a situation where we've now built up this nest egg, we've built up this wealth, and how do we most effectively deploy it post-retirement? So that's a, a longer intro than probably I intended to give. But hopefully that sets the scene for why what Dean is going to talk about, we believe, is such an important part of the broader life insurance landscape. So, Dean, if with that, I'll, uh, I'll give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll start with just telling us a little bit about who you are, your story, and, and how you came to be part of Just. Thanks, Brad. And just before I start on that, I, I just... Um, Echoing the comments you've made, yeah. So we're really excited to be um, to be partnering with with Icon. Um, <clears throat> Just itself has no tied sales force. We we absolutely rely on um, independent advisors assessing our products and deciding that they the best available to meet the needs of their clients. So um, the space that you're filling in the market is is fantastic and. And I think all of what you're saying, um, <clears throat> insurance should should be all about income replacement and not some sort of windfall gain if um, if an event happens. But yeah, on that background, so so who am I? I think if I describe myself, um, I'm I'm somebody who likes to lay a strong foundation in life and then take calculated risks on the back of that. So um, the way I've lived that out in my life is I. I studied to be an actuary and that gave me my foundation and then when I got married the first thing we did was sell everything um, put a backpack on our back and and um, go around the world for a year and we the calculated risk was that um, people think about what they're doing that when they reach retirement and then they, they don't have enough energy <laughs> to do that anymore and part of that calculated risk was taking a medicine bag with me that would cover all our ailments over a year and a note from the doctor which came in very handy when we were stopped by the Thai police as we crossed the border from Laos into Thai so um, no intelligible language exchange took place at that point but but they gave us the bag back so, so those calculated risks pay off sometimes. Actually the approach to backpacking. <laughs> yeah absolutely and the other thing about me is I love to start with a blank sheet of paper. If I'm given a problem, I, I don't like looking at something that's there already. Um, so let's start with a blank sheet of paper and then as things go along, <clears throat> pick up what, what others might be doing. And I've really liked starting things. So, so right from the beginning of my career, I was, I was the one actually on the team of 30 that started Metropolitan Employee Benefits. Um, <clears throat> and that was a, a, a great journey. And, and then I've just like to be doing things differently um, since then. And my, my worldview is one based in my, my Christian faith principles. So I, I really value fairness. I, um, I like to build relationships on trust. And I love to see the underdog get the opportunity to, to realize its full potential and to win consistently. So when I then 
looked at a career as an actuary and uh, started looking at the, the issue of retirement because that's really all about helping people to take their money and, and use it wisely. Um, I really believe the retirement industry has let South African retirees down badly. When you look at those statistics that you quoted earlier, only 6% of people reaching retirement with enough money. And then I think the, the thing that really troubles me most is that the money they do have when they reach retirement is then not used in an optimal way. And in fact, we'll get into this more as we talk, but that people could be consuming more with less risk if they use their, their capital wisely. I mean, I think that's a powerful line. I, it's come up a few times in our conversation. It's something that I've never really clicked until now. This idea that actually if you structure your post-retirement effectively, you can actually consume more with less risk. You know, I think too often we assume that, that making a sensible decision, the less risky decision is the one that is, uh, requires the most discipline and the most sacrifice. And this may be one of the few times where that isn't the case. Yes, absolutely. So Dean, you, you chatted a little bit about being the underdog and backing the underdog. And, and I mean, I, I resonate with that. I love that idea. The reality is that most people love the underdog, but in this industry, it's difficult to back the underdog because you need to know that the business is safe, stable, sound, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be around in 100 years to deliver on the promises. Can you maybe give us just some comfort that while Just is a bit of a challenger, it still has that kind of stability and backing? Yes, absolutely. So, and, and, and let's go to where the Just journey started. So mm. after that backpacking around the world, my wife and I spent um, years in, in the UK, came back to South Africa, and I was working for one of the big brands in South Africa at the time that National Treasury released its papers on retirement reform. And the two main points they were making there were saying people in living annuities are drawing at unsustainable levels and they're going to run out of money. And actually, they would have liked to have made an element of life annuity compulsory. But when they looked at the pricing of life annuities in the South African market, because everybody pays the same price, regardless of <laughs> the life expectancy, the poor people who, who, or the relatively poor people who, who you would expect to live shorter, end up cross-subsidizing the relatively wealthy. And that didn't make sense. And we, we touched on that a little bit earlier, but, but this idea of the the less wealthy subsidizing the, the more wealthy, uh, or the other way around rather, is, is because of this link between health and wealth. Yeah, so, so basically if, if people are relatively wealthy, they've had better access to nutrition, better access to medical care, their life expectancy would be longer. For people who, who haven't had those benefits in, in life, they would have a shorter life expectancy. And it doesn't make sense in the, in the life industry, we, we do underwriting, up to the age of 60, where you know somebody's somebody's an extra risk, so they pay a higher premium or um, or maybe even a decline cover, and then they turn 60 and they say, okay, now the insurance company is going to pay me money, and then the the same insurer says, oh, now you're a standard risk. So, so how did somebody who was an extra risk all their life suddenly, because they turned 60, become a standard risk? So, so just, and, and in the whole context of treating customers fairly, I, I don't know how you do underwriting before 60 and not, not after 60. But that in itself is quite a, quite a paradigm shift because a poor risk prior to retirement becomes a, a better <laughs> risk post-retirement. So almost you have to flip everything on its head. Yes, exactly. And because they're going to be paid for a shorter period of time. So, yeah. um, so that pot of money they're bringing into that um, should, should be fairly priced. Again, sorry to interrupt, but to your point of fairness, yeah. I mean, those people have paid a premium or a loading on their premiums their entire life. And yes. it doesn't seem right that they then get to retirement and they don't get a, a corresponding discount or enhancement post-retirement, almost as a, as a reward for the loadings that you paid so often uh, for so long. Yes, and they paid those extra loadings, and and now now whatever they've done, they've managed themselves to get to <laughs> to, to to not have to call on the the benefits, and, and then they they get penalised again um, in retirement. So I try to get this onto the product development agenda at the the big company I was working for, and it got to point nine on the agenda, and then the the sort of product development cycles of big companies two other items fell off 
just because they couldn't be done anymore. And then two other things got put in its place and it stayed at number nine. And I just saw this was never going to happen. And that if we were going to try to address the issues that Treasury were, was raising, it needed to be done by someone new. And in the UK, I'd had some exposure to just retirement, as they were called at that point, and had seen how they started this market in the UK. And, and now more than half the annuities in the UK are, are underwritten at retirement. So through various contacts, I, I got in touch with first the marketing director and then the, the CEO. And they were very interested in the developments in, in South Africa. And, and they agreed to back us. Because for me, it was very important. We couldn't be a cottage industry driven out of a garage. It had to have a strong balance sheet behind it. We had to set up proper governance. Um, so when we recruited for our board of directors, uh, Peter Doyle, who was my CEO at Metropolitan, who gave me a bursary when I was an actuarial student. So <laughs> somebody I've walked a whole lifetime with, uh, he, he agreed to join us um, and bring his wealth of experience as, as chairman of the board. And then um, Herman Vessels, who was a leading auditor at PwC for the insurance industry, um, he, he joined as our chairman of the audit committee. So we had a small board, but a really high quality board, set up the governance, um, took a lot from the UK to, um, to, to be able to meet all the governance requirements. And that really paid off when the Prudential Authority visited us. They were very impressed at our level of governance for a, a relatively small insurance company. And yeah, you can see from the slide there that the, the just group, when you look at the just group and you bring it into a South African context, it's, it's about the size of an, an MMI or, or a Liberty. And when you look at what we're doing in South Africa, so we're fully backed in South Africa. As a South African entity, we have all the capital cover that we require, we've got all the, um, the independence of the board. But if there was any risk that materialized and needed to go up to the group level, we are such a small part of, of group relative to their excess capital that, uh, yeah, we, we are very well funded and secure. Right. Look, I, I mean, for me, the important part of this is that, you know, you touched on it earlier, everyone loves the underdog. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's prepared to risk literally their life savings was an underdog. Yes. And, uh, and the, the important thing here is that while just in South Africa is able to behave and act like a challenger business, you backed by and, and part of something much, much bigger, which gives everyone that comfort. Yes. Maybe if we can- If, if, I, if I contextualize that, Brad, uh, when I think of us as an underdog, I think of us like the, the Springbok team of 95 who had been written off, um, but, but triumph because they had they had the backing of the, um, the infrastructure behind them to make it work. So that's what we're trying to do with, with Just. So maybe if we can shift uh, focus for a minute, we, we've kind of talked about you and Just a little bit. Let's take a step and, and, and look at the industry just from a macro lens. What are the products available? What does the landscape post-retirement look like at the moment? Um, and, and here's a sort of a summary that you can take us through your thoughts here. Yeah, so the broad categories, when people reach retirement, they choose a, a living annuity or a life annuity. And there's three flavors of, of life annuity that, that's out there. And this slide just summarizes nicely sort of what, what you get in the, the various products. So the living annuities, probably 90% of South African money at the moment goes to living annuities, which are very good for managing your own money in a pot and you have all the investment tools that you would want to, to manage your money in that pot. It doesn't give you protection against living longer than, than average. The only protection you can get against inflation risk is by drawing at a relatively lower level in a, in a living annuity. So there'll be lots of press around that being somewhere around four and a half percent, five percent, some people say. Yeah, so the, the everything is quite clear and transparent and, and then the fees that are there on that, that, that's what determines your value for money. With a life annuity, you you get the guarantee. So, so the difference here, all three flavors of life annuity give you some form of income that's payable for life, no, no matter how long you live. If you live to 100, this income will still be paying out. And then just how you provide that. So I'll start with the first two inflation risks, so inflation link that's actually linked to the CPI index, which sort of gives cold comfort really because you, you know, you it escalates with CPI, but your your inflation in retirement is 
probably different to the yeah. uh, back up CPI. And I know some advisors like five uh, percent fixed escalation. That, that is given South Africa's history of of what can happen to inflation and global concerns emerging now around inflation. It's, it's quite difficult to say that that's going to be good enough for a 20 year time horizon. And then obviously there's the investment risk is taken away and mm-hmm. because um, it's, it's matched out in, in the bond market, those two. But people sometimes talk about fees and there's, there's a lot of, well, smoke and mirrors in the, in the industry around that, but really I think the best way to assess, are you getting value for money is to look at the annuity rate that you're getting and how it's tracking against inflation and compare that to the drawdown rate that you can get on, on a living annuity. I've left, the, I've left the last bucket. We've called that Julie. That, that's our just lifetime income, but it's, it's a with profit annuity concept. There, your income is guaranteed for life. You don't get an exact match on inflation, but you get an increase which you, you directly link to an investment portfolio, like a balanced fund, and you can choose your your increase category but but you can choose a category for example where if that gives you cpi plus four after management fees then then you will get inflation as an increase and then you're not linked to government bonds only you're actually now invested in a a balanced fund something similar to what you would be following in a living annuity strategy and because it relaxes that guarantee slightly because you get what that portfolio returns it generally makes it a cheaper proposition than an inflation-linked annuity and, and um, it varies through, through time, but probably 10, 10 to 20% better value for money that you get in a, in a with-profit annuity. So if I, if I was kind of summarized from left to right, the living annuity is effectively an investment where you draw down an amount every month and you hope, hope you're getting a higher investment return than you're drawing down, otherwise you're depleting your capital. And it's, well, yeah. a, it's a race against time, literally. <laughs> <laughs> yes you hope you outlive you're it. actually betting well I, I often say that, that it's got the wrong name it should be called a dying annuity because it, <laughs> it works really well for you provided you die before an average life yeah. expectancy it, it, or or if you've got so much money that you can draw at a level where you, you you're drawing within the sort of recommended and, and the reality is i mean given the stat of 94 percent of people can't afford to retire most people aren't able to draw below the recommended level, which means that most people are going to be in a situation where they are more than likely going to run out of capital while they're still alive. You know, and I suppose that brings us a little bit to the next topic is, is if this is what's happening currently, and, and I, you made the point earlier, I think 90% of money is going into the living annuity space currently. And that's in a world where people are living longer and working longer than ever before. Inflation in South Africa, at least in the South African context, is relatively low by historical levels, but has a significant upside risk. And investment returns are are volatile and and almost impossible to predict. So if you play that forward, where do you think we're going as a South African retirement industry? What do do you think the next decade holds for us, given the practices up until now? I I don't have any doubt there is going to be a living annuity crisis that manifests in this decade. And we're going to see an increasing amount of newspaper headlines talking about that. And why am I such a prophet of doom? The drawdown rates are too high. We challenged the figures that used to be made public a number of years ago. We we started, if you go into Treasury's papers, they actually gave you a breakdown of the books. And we took those books and we, we sort of rolled them forward based on the investment returns that we were seeing. And we could see that broadly a quarter of living annuity clients were fine and would remain fine. And the other 75% were heading towards this precipice because we've seen lower investment returns um, over the last decade. People are living longer. And the, the thing that people forget often is that the first living annuities were sold around the turn of the century. So nobody has had a living annuity policy for longer than about 20 years. If, Probably the first living annuity policy hold if they're still alive um, would have now had their policy for maybe 25 years. We we expect people f- from the date they retire to live probably for about 20 years on average. So that means that everybody we've seen so far in a living annuity has been living in the first half of their life. Now, for the first time, we're seeing living annuity policyholders living beyond average life expectancy. So the half that we expected to live beyond life expectancy are now heading into that stage. 
and that's when sustainability becomes the issue, really. And up until now, the drawdown and rates have, have typically averaged more than is recommended. They've averaged more than what's recommended, and um, it was based. So the early two thousands investment returns were still strong, but this the, the sort of two thousand and ten to two thousand and twenty decade, the investment returns weren't weren't as strong, and the drawdown rates weren't adjusted down. So and we we've seen lots of living annuity books. The average drawdown rates are typically around eight percent, and that's an average. So so bear in mind that those with a lot of money are drawing two and a half percent. So when you get an eight percent average, it means there's a lot that are drawing ten percent or more. And and once you get into that category that you hit ten percent, the um, the rate at which you consume your capital is um, is very significant. You run but, out of money. again. I mean, not to sound like a prophet of doom, because there are some some solutions available but that does seem like the perfect storm you know people are, are are now reaching the the median expected retirement or expected age of, of death as, as macabre as that sounds um, and are, are likely to continue to live longer and longer investment returns have been poor drawdown rates have been too high inflation is probably at the bottom and has the risk of going up i mean that's a that's a pretty scary place to be if i'm 80 to 85 and uh, slowly running out of my capital. Yes, yes, it is, and and it makes you very sensitive. I said I like to lay a strong foundation and then take calculated risks. Unfortunately, what we're seeing in the market now is people living on the edge, and then a COVID crisis hits and the bottom drops out of the market, and then people feel now I have to jump. So just as they see the assets fall by twenty percent, we saw a lot of people move at that point to to life annuities and and lock in. Fortunately, yeah, with profit annuities, the the price sort of moves with that, so you can still lock in reasonable value in those um, in those market conditions. But now that the markets have recovered, actually now is a great buying opportunity for annuities because we've got. <laughs> For once, we've got a perfect storm in the right direction, that we've got markets that have recovered and we've got interest rates which are, are high, which support a good annuity rate. And just as a brief aside, about 1% of the interest rates that we're seeing now, which, which means a 10% higher starting annuity rate, is just because of concerns around global volatility in bond markets. So it's nothing to do with risk or anything else. It's, it's just those international fund managers and that's that's what they demand as a return so so it does give this opportunity now to sort of lock in some of those gains that's that people are seeing in the market so we've got probably five to ten minutes left and then i'll leave some space if there are any questions so there are a couple of things i'd really oh. like us to cover the, the one is what do you think we should do so what is the what is the appropriate steps now? What are your recommendations? And then I'd like to touch on one or two of the concerns that people typically have with life annuities, principally the one around a guarantee. Okay. So maybe let's start on on I mean knowing what you know now, having painted the scene, the products that are available. What would you recommend as the approach now? So how people should manage the money they've got in the most appropriate way is that they should compartmentalize in their mind two buckets and one which says here's a pot of money I'm going to set aside to meet my essential expenses for as long as I live that money is mine it's going to keep me alive and nobody's going to inherit that 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 in fact is my security that I'm not going to have to beg for my children when I get into my 80s and that money well okay so let, let's just talk about the two parts then any other money that I've got that's money that allows me to be a little bit flexible around um, maybe I can draw more, maybe I'm in the early stages of retirement and I want to do a few trips, um, go and see grandchildren around the country, and whatever I've got left in that bucket is for my beneficiaries. And that is my money, nobody else is getting that money. So when we look at the tools, start with that second bucket, as soon as you say that's my money and <laughs> that's best in living annuity you know you you you're going to um it gives you the flexibility and um and whatever's left there um, goes to uh, to beneficiaries that first bucket which says this is this is money to meet my expenses that absolutely i need to incur to keep me alive i can't take risk with that and that needs to pay me even if I live to 100. And the only way you can get 
that certainty is by putting that in, in a life annuity. Now, the, the point you made earlier around people being able to consume more with lower risk, if, if you take this first bucket, firstly, if you said, I'm still going to treat it the same way, that's my money and nobody else gets to it. You need to be comfortable that that's going to keep you alive until you turn 95 or 100, because you have there's, there's about a 10% chance that you're going to get there. So, And if you do get there, you don't want to be the 100-year-old sleeping under a bridge. So maybe you won't reach 100 then. So then the, if you were managing that in a living annuity, you would have to have a drawdown rate, which was low to be able to last you until you get to, to 100. If you say, actually, because nobody's going to inherit that, I'm prepared to throw that into a pool with a community of other investors. We as, insur as insurer will then collect a whole community of people like that. And now, now we have certain, because we don't know when any one person will die. But if we've got a thousand, we know pretty much how many people are going to die each year. And so we then price off an average life expectancy of reaching about mid 80s. So that means our planning horizon as an insurer has to be about 10 years shorter than somebody trying to do it on their own balance sheet without insurance. But Dean, just to, and, to use this picture to make that kind of idea come alive, if we looked at yeah. the, the female chart on the right, what they're telling us is that if there, are, if there are 100 females that retire at 65, 75 of them will still be alive at age 80, 50 of them will still be alive at age 87, 25 will still be alive at age 94, and 10 will still be alive at age 100. Yeah. And for, for one individual to plan for the possibility of being alive at 100 would be almost impossible to handle that risk on their own balance sheet and in inverted commas, and, and is probably going to result in, in overly conservative decision making. Yes. And, and it forces you into a very low drawdown rate, mm -hmm. if you were looking at that bucket, to make sure that it was going to last until that length of time. Whereas the, the life annuity rate you will get on that bucket will be around 2.5% or more higher than the drawdown rate that, that'll keep you going until age 100, just because we've got a shorter planning horizon. We've got a couple of questions coming through, and I'll, I'll just bring them up as they come up, and some of them we'll address in a few seconds. But So Harris asked, is the life expectancy not longer these days on the top end of the market due to medical solutions? And, and I guess the answer is unequivocally yes. But even in aggregate, the life expectancy is improving. And it's exaggerated probably at the top end of the market. And, and maybe just a follow-up to that is I would assume if we're talking about post-retirement or retirees who are investing money in annuities, you're probably really talking about the top end of the market anyway. And certainly if you if you're looking from a population perspective in, in yeah. South Africa. And that is true, and it's a very good point. And it's, so our pricing allows for what we've seen in the past on longevity and what we're seeing in the future and trends in longevity. It takes all of that into account. People often discard a life annuity for people that are wealthy and have very low drawdown rates. In fact, the principle that I mentioned earlier of having one bucket, which is to meet your expenses, and another bucket to, to draw flexibly still applies even if you're um, even if you're a healthy, wealthy person. And, and we're slightly anticipating the, the solution that we, we really like when you, you take a life annuity and put it inside a living annuity so that the life annuity pays into your living annuity. You can, for the healthy, wealthy person, we, we can show that they they would end up if they do live longer they end up making more money that way because they still benefit from living longer than than the average so anybody who backs themselves to live longer than the average is also doing better in in a life annuity and should have that as part of their investment portfolio not 100 percent of the assets but the bit that they that they're spending every month I mean, you were introducing this idea of two buckets or two components. One is, is the income you absolutely need to live on and, and you need that guaranteed for life to avoid you becoming a drain on family or friends or, or running out of cash. And we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. The, the second one is almost the, the discretionary income where you can afford to take a bit of a, take a, bit of a bet. You can, you can play the markets a bit and, and be a bit more aggressive. Yeah. Just in the first piece, and, and, and you explain this idea of kind of pooling of risk that the most appropriate mechanism there is a life annuity because you're balancing your risk. 
I think the question that, that Harold raises is an interesting one because you, you've got these two extremes. You've got, if there is this correlation between wealth and health, you've got the less wealthy requiring a higher drawdown relative to their, their, their assets, but probably with a lower expected lifetime. And then you've got the very wealthy who can afford a lower drawdown, but are likely to live for longer. And, and those two almost cancel each other out so that actually at either extreme of the spectrum, there's a case that a life annuity is still sensible for at least a component of it. And that's, that's yeah. kind of what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. The, when you go to that principle, whatever the money is that's in your, this covers my essential expenses, that's the bit that's best hmm. matched in a life annuity because it's, it's the only thing that gives you the longevity protection. And in fact, people often think in investment terms, but there is no asset you can buy which automatically increases the longer you live, except insurance or a life annuity. It's, it's the only asset that you get that the longer you live, the more valuable it becomes. And the, I mean, we, we could spend another hour, but we might. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, I'm going to try and just tell you the, the themes I'd like us to cover and then we can, we can knock them out. The, the first one is, is, I mean, this principle of two buckets, I think is a really powerful, it's a, it's a great way to think about things that, the question is, what, what logic do you use when you're allocating across those buckets and how do you prioritize? And the, the next point for me is just, you touched on this annuity within an annuity. I'd like you just to explain that in a couple of minutes. And then the question that comes up every single time, and it's actually come up, um, uh, Seren's asked it as well, uh, sorry, Harrod did as well, is what, what are the guaranteed options available? You know, the, the typical downside of a life annuity is that there's no legacy, there's no money left behind. And actually you've addressed some of those concerns. And then maybe we can just wrap up practically with what, what, how does an advisor access the rates and the benefits you're talking about here? So the, the logic across the two buckets, the, the way I like to think of things is saying uh, bucket one, my essential expenses, not what I'm spending now at, at the time that I reach retirement, but let me say when I'm in my mid seventies, I'm moving into a retirement village, for example, and I'm going to draw up my budget. Now, this is what I'm, I, I can actually say, that's where I'm going to go. This is what I'm going to have to pay as um, my, my accommodation costs and I can work out my grocery bill and everything and I can draw up a little budget for that. And that's my essential expenses, which if I can secure those at retirement, I know that whatever happens to me, that's where I'm ending up and my expenditure is covered. Now anything that I've got left can go into bucket two. That even allows me to say from 65 to 75, I'm going to use my money a little bit. I'm, I am going to travel a little bit. And so I'm going to accept a slightly higher drawdown. And I'm not going to have sleepless nights about it because I know that when I hit 75, that's my budget that I've drawn up and I've got that covered. So, so that's, that's the logic that I would use for, for allocating across the, the two buckets. And then you just say, that's my essential expenses. I go out and I get a, a quote on, on a life annuity for that. In the South African context where 94% of people aren't able to afford to retire, the, the reality is that most people should be filling up bucket one before they consider bucket two. Yes, they should. And on average. Sometimes. Yeah. And, and sometimes that's a very hard discussion because they um when they look at their retirement savings it, it may not even be enough to fill back at one but better that you find that out on day one and then make the adjustments to lifestyle and budget at that point than discover it um in your mid 70s or, or 80 when you you're desperate for money from somewhere else <clears throat> um and and also if you discover it early in your retirement Maybe you've got an option to still earn income some way, uh, some consulting or some freelancing or childcare, or mm -hmm. there's, um, there's various ways that you can keep an income going. So, so bucket two might actually be income you generate. Yes. Okay, so, so then the life in a living um, annuity and, and how's that possible? So that we are very proud to develop that for, for South Africa because when we looked at this dilemma, we got to the, this conclusion, it's... The, the, the stumbling block you come up with is if somebody's already bought a living annuity, then um, <clears throat> they only have two options. They can either flip it completely to a life annuity or they can stay in a, in a living annuity. And so that just seemed to be a structure which was preventing sensible decision-making. So we, 
did a lot of work to, to come up with a structure. Initially, we were told it wasn't possible. We, we researched internationally, and then we, we came up with a structure, um, wrote a legal opinion, and then a legal firm found there was no reason not to be able to sign that legal opinion, um, took it to the, um, the Market Conduct Authority, and they were very excited about it with the full realization that if you have a life annuity as an asset within a living annuity, <clears throat> an advisor is able to charge trail fees on all assets that are in a living annuity, including that asset. Um, but for them, the, the key thing was actually this solved a more important crisis in South Africa that people could run out of money in a, um, in a living annuity. And, and so they were supportive of it. So we, we have partnered with um, living annuity providers because we, we don't want to reinvent the wheel where we don't have to. We, we are experts in creating the life annuities that, that go into those wrappers. And then we've partnered with, um, <clears throat> with some of the big brands um, who, who do have very good living annuities. So, um, so Alan Gray and um, Alexander Forbes um, and uh, um, Signia, <clears throat> um, PPS, uh, Citadel, we, we're in all of those um, living annuities. And then what, what you have then is a life annuity that pays into the living annuity. So the assets then become part of the, the, the living annuity. It gives fantastic flexibility because um, you could say, I, I don't need to draw down that amount initially, but I can have it pay into my living annuity and I can keep rolling it up in my living annuity. There's no tax on any of those payments yet because it stays within the living annuity wrapper and I, I draw it when I need it. And the protection it gives people is if, if people do hit the ceiling in that 17.5% and uh, it falls away, you've got this, this life annuity as the assets drop the life annuity income kicks in and, and it creates a flaw under um, what people can consume. I love that story of um, you couldn't get the legal opinion you wanted, so you <laughs> so you gave it to them. <laughs> Sometimes you, yeah, when it's all written down, the, then they can reference it. Yeah. See if yeah, I, mean, I think it's a it's a it's a it's a inspirational story. I don't mean to be too dramatic, but it's it's a great example of of seeing something that that is needed um and and when you are trying to create a change and you're trying to do something different and the, you know the traditional way of thinking often says it can't can't happen the the last point before we kind of touch on practically how can advisors access just is for me the important one is that there's a strong argument in favor of of life annuities um for all the reasons you've made um investment risk longevity risk etc cetera, etc cetera. The, probably the biggest behavioral reason why people shy away from that is this idea of, of not being able to leave a legacy. Can you, can you maybe just tell me, A, is that true? And, and B, what are the options that you have available in the life annuity to solve that? And it, it's not true. And, and unfortunately, the, um, the press often dumbs down the comparisons and, and it becomes this and it starts to become part of language. And people say that you, you have your legacy in a, in a living annuity, you don't have it in a life annuity. And it's absolutely untrue. And it's, it's similar to the concept that you were talking about around protecting income rather than protecting capital. Because you can, you can have your life annuity, you can choose a spouse's income benefit, which can range from 50% to 100% of the, the income that, that's payable. Mm -hmm. So you can really target it down to, your, to the needs of your spouse. And if you've got young beneficiaries um so you need regardless of whether you and your spouse die you need the annuity to pay for at least 10 years until they into their 20s um, <clears throat> you, you can put a minimum payment period of of um, 10 years the minimum payment periods can go up to 20 years so in fact there's there's a lot of flexibility around the life annuity to create an income legacy and um, so I've, I've started to use that terminology, because a living annuity is all about a capital legacy, and, and it's about this lump sum windfall payout, um, which is then not giving you any protection at all. Um, whereas on a life annuity, you can structure it to, to leave the income legacy that, that you need to and, and protect the income of your, your beneficiaries. Right. Thanks. And I mean, and 
again, we, we, we make the point over and over again that the reality is, and, and I think you made the point, is that people dream about leaving a legacy for their children. But the current state of affairs is that most people are going to be asking their children for money at the age of 80. And, and it's a sad reality, but it is, it is the truth. And, and we need to make the most appropriate decisions recognizing that. So uh, the, the one last point as well to, <clears throat> to throw in here is that um, typically women are around three to four years younger than their husbands in <clears throat> South African context. And then women live around 45 years longer than men in South Africa. So when we talk about this issue of a living annuity and possibly running out of money, it's often the widow mm. who's going to live the last 10 years on her own. Um, and, and that's where the issue really manifests. Um, and, and too often we find in planning horizons um, that, that advisors aren't considering, well, not generalize, <laughs> but, but we have had conversations where people haven't considered um, the difference. planning horizon to include the, the spouse. So, I mean, before I wrap up, Dean, just how can, how can advisors access just products? I mean, you've really touched on that, the, the life annuity, insider living annuity is available on, on, on most of the significant platforms in the market. You've already spoken about those, Alan Gray, Alexander Forbes, Signia, PPS, Citadel. Um, obviously, this morning's discussion is makes it obvious that that Just is now proudly one of Icon's product providers. Um, so our team has been thoroughly trained. We we work closely with Just team over the last month or two, and and almost everything that Dean spoken about today, we're able to help you with. Um, so we're 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 ready. Our, our solutions specialist team understand the product well. We're ready to support you on the quotes. And, and it's been amazing for me just, just being involved in, in a handful over the past week. You know, the, this, this story comes alive um, or is made real when you see the, car, the cold hard numbers. Um, I, I looked at a quote just yesterday of a 60 year old retiring and, uh, and the income that was available through a Julie was 15 to 20% higher than the next best life annuity. And that, you know, when you express it in percentages, you almost lose the power of what that means. But if you think about retiring with a million rand, that 15% is giving you effectively a free 150,000 rands worth of savings. It, it's, it's an incredibly powerful game changer post-retirement. And this idea of being able to consume more with less risk, I, I think is, is one of the, it sounds like a contradiction, but it's one of the, one of the realities of, of taking this approach. So if, if I could have a go, just summarizing a couple of things you've said, Dean, and stop me if you feel like I've missed something, but I guess we, we started out almost painting the, the picture that there's a real concern coming. And, and I think you, your statement was that we're facing a headline, a decade of, of bad headlines. And, and having said that though, there are solutions available and there are, there are we think um, right now, in fact, there's a, there's a moment where the, the, the rates and the terms are significantly better than they were previously, and there's an opportunity to capitalize on that. But this idea that there's a, there's a mix between living and life annuities and, and, and a way of thinking about in your two bucket approach for me was really powerful and really easy to understand. The first thing is what is the income that you absolutely need? And, and, and it's worth taking your clients through that process, really unpacking their budget, figuring out what are the, what are the critical essentials that they cannot live without. And even just that budgeting process is a, is a powerful process in and of itself. The best way to meet those needs is with a life annuity. There, there is no argument um, for me against that. The second bucket is, is the additional income, the discretionary income, the, 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 the stuff that you can live without, but you would love to have. And there a living annuity is a great solution. Um, and, and more so than that, actually, the blended approach, the, the life annuity inside a living annuity creates this best of both worlds, um, both worlds scenario that we're looking for. So if we're trying to figure out what is the change we're trying to create, if, if in South Africa today, more than 90% of post-retirement money is going into a living annuity, we want to flip that around. 
And we want to flip that around, not because that's what Just says or not because that's the products that Just has available, but because we genuinely believe that that is in the interests of the South African retiree. And that's going to help us shift to avoiding some of these dangerous headlines that we're going to start seeing going forward. Is there anything you'd like to, to add in closing, Dee? Um, Brad, if I can ask you to bring up one slide in closing, just the, um, the slide with the blue line and the coral line and the, the dots around it. <laughs> We've got to have a scatter plot. The scatter plot, yeah. So th this just brings it to life for me as well. The, the blue line is what the market conduct authority recommends as a drawdown rate on living annuities to have a 90 percent chance of sustaining your income to to your average life expectancy um, or a 50 percent chance of sustaining it to um, um to to your age in the mid 90s the the coral line that you see above that is the just with profit annuity rate and the little dots that you see around is from an actual advisor's living annuity book. So, so you can see um, where, where people are situated, but those clients in category two are clearly above the recommended drawdown rate, um, <clears throat> but below the annuity rate. They, they clearly benefit from having a portion of their money going into, um, <clears throat> into that Julie product. And those in category three who are above that even actually need a little bit of budget readjustment, um, but, but the Julia annuity can help them um, to, um, to be sustainable for longer. The, 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 those in category four are, the, are there and there may be reasons why they're there. Those in category one will still benefit from a portion in a life annuity but that, that's as a diversifying asset. So it's just that pot that we were talking about and, um, and, and putting some of it in there. But it really, and we can do this for advisors. We can, we can bring up their, their clients. And, and so you can be very targeted in your, in your discussions with clients. I see. I, I mean, one of the things that's really struck me in, in getting to know you guys and, and understanding the, the products better over the past few months is that I originally thought this was the decision that has to be made at retirement. And if you make it wrong, well, that's too late. Um, and I think what the scatter plot shows really powerfully is that each advisor can, can go through their client base, almost map them, and there's a particular strategy for each client, regardless of, of which age they are. And, and there are opportunities to, to look to shift and make changes even deep into retirement. Yeah. Yeah, it's never too late. <laughs> great. Well, that's, that feels like a, a great one-liner to stop on. So... Um, <laughs> We, we are finished. I, I, um, I'm happy to stick around for a couple of minutes if there are any questions. I think we've been able to answer most of the questions so far. Uh, I see there's one that's just come through from Seren. But if anyone needs to leave, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And, and I hope that at the very least, we've, we've given you something new to think about. Um, and, and, and there's a, and, 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 and Dean's idea of two buckets or, or, or two two angles to look at gives you a framework um, to start having discussions with your clients around what they do with their retirement money. So really appreciate your time and have a, have a wonderful rest of the day and week. Thanks, for those of you still, still here, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm just saying thanks for the opportunity to, um, to be able to share with you today. But yeah, I'll, I'll stay around as well. If I really enjoyed it. Uh, I see Sarenja sent through a question now that the most critical aspect of an advisor is to explore what's available in terms of this post-retirement period and access to the various options and benefits must be, must be available easily rather than consulting another agent to expose the product or quote. Uh, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and that's where we really believe that Icon can, can provide a valuable service to you, is providing that independent central um, access point. Yeah. And I... Um... Our whole philosophy is that <clears throat> advisors should be able to quote as quickly as possible. So we do have tools available that, that can produce quotes um, live with the caveat that obviously if we need to do underwriting then um, <clears throat> on, on those sort of bits. So, so all of our with profit annuities, which are the, which is our, we, we think our best solution. We issue an instant guaranteed quote um, 
and then we take people through underwriting. So, so you can only improve on that rate um, through underwriting. It, it won't get worse. Um, and that instant guaranteed quote, it's, it, it's there. It can be drawn immediately. We have a quotes tool and we can, we can sign an advisor up to that or, or they can access it through, through you. Um, and and our, our whole aim is to be able to get advisors into a position where they could be sitting with a client and, um, and actually drawing quotes live. Where, when there is underwriting required, we do the underwriting. So we make a telephone call. Um, it's typically a 10 minute call. It's a friendly call. We, we're looking for reasons to enhance the income rather than the other way around. So um, sometimes we go through a whole questionnaire and um, the, the person hasn't disclosed they've got hypertension, but when we ask, is there any other medication you're taking and they, they mention that we can, we can see that actually um, that must be medication for hypertension, which, which could have given them an uplift. Um, so, so we try to help in, in the process as much as possible. Dean, one last thing before we sign off. There's been a question around capital preservation options. Now you touched on the income preservation options in the, in the life annuity. Can you just talk to me about but what exists from a capital preservation point of view? So we have focused on the income benefits for the reason that they can be more targeted and, and you can then set what, what the spouse is getting and set the, the minimum um, income period. However, we do also, um, if the main member and spouse die um, together, now you enter a minimum payment period, we can capitalize that and pay that out as a lump sum. So, so that's the sort of solution that we have in place there at the moment. And, and we always think that if it's, if it's a capital preservation, you can, you can specify that as an income. So if you're trying to preserve the capital, then you can, you, you can do it through choosing 100% spouse's income um, and choosing a minimum payment period of a, a certain amount of time. Obviously, the more of those benefits you add, the, the lower the annuity okay. rate will be. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think Great. we covered everything. Thank you. Sign off. Excellent. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for your time. Cheers, everybody.